Good barely afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Andy Littow, and it's my pleasure today to introduce, introduce Romilio Escobar, who I call Roger. Um, Roger received his PhD from the uh, University, National Autonomous University of Mexico, and was working with Carlos Bruner in 2007 after which he spent two years on a postdoc with me, um, teaching me all kinds of things, and hopefully he learned something along the way. Um, Roger returned to UNAM in 2010 after the postdoc with me, and continues to be um, a professor in the, in the School of Psychology there. He also is a former editor of the Mexican Journal of Behavior, of Behavior Analysis, and he's made many contributions to EAB, to the history of psychology. In particular, he has discovered uh, some old apparatus from around the turn of the 20th century that he has uh, researched and curated. And produce some very interesting insights into early experimental psychology in Mexico as a result. And of course, he's also done an awful lot of work on the subject of today's tutorial. I want to mention a couple of things about Roger. I, and I, I know Roger pretty well, and I know that Roger doesn't do things half-heartedly, and I know that because of the work that he did with me. Um, not only the research, but the, he did some really cool historical research uh, while he was at West Virginia that we, uh, we have since published. Um, one of the things that he did was to discover that the snap lead, that humble piece of wire that you see hanging off of old relay racks, uh, actually has its origin, or had its origins in early 18th century Industrial Revolution in England. And he also has, has an, he had an interest and in, still does have an interest in discriminative, discrimination, uh, learning discriminative control, in particular observing responses. And so Roger got interested in um, Ben Wyckoff, who is the father of observing responses. It turns out that Ben Wyckoff also was a very important figure in programmed instruction. And in the course of looking at into Ben Wyckoff's history, uh, Roger made the amazing discovery that Wyckoff not only was an important experimental psychologist, but also was a leader in the civil rights movement in the South, in the American South, and was responsible for um, developing some ideas around uh, literacy education that, that came out of his work on program instruction. But it's that kind of stuff that makes Roger so such an interesting scientist because he goes into things in depth and really, you know, gets to the bottom of issues. Um, he applies that same kind of rigor and enthusiasm to the work that he's going to talk about today, which I think is, I think is a profession-changing work because what he has done, and he will tell you more about it, is to make available to people that might not otherwise be able to conduct research of the sort that behavior analysts like to conduct uh, very inexpensively and, and very, um, very easily. Um, and without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Roger to uh, present on present and future of instrumentation for offered research, Arduino boards, and state program. Roger. Thank you very much, Andy, for that nice introduction. Uh, thank you also for the invitation. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about my work on instrumentation. And uh, this is the equipment that is commonly found in operant conditioning laboratories. As an undergraduate student in psychology at UNAM in Mexico, I was marveled uh, when I first saw these chambers. Uh, it was at this point that I knew that I found a place in which science, I mean, natural, basic, rigorous science was done. And 
the, no one doubts that scientific instruments are fundamental for the advancement of science. Operant conditions in chambers enable us uh, to measure a small sample of behavior within a time frame and, most importantly, help us to determine accurately how behavior is affected by carefully controlled antecedent events and consequences. In this video, a rat presses a metal lever and contingent on the lever press, a foot pellet is delivered in a small tray. A green circle signals the activation of the pellet dispenser. Uh, operant laboratory, laboratory equipment has two main components. The operant condition chamber that we saw in the video and uh, the control equipment that in modern uh, laboratories includes an interface that connects the chamber with a computer in which the schedules of reinforcement are programmed. This is a diagram that separates the component uh, of the operant lab equipment. The control equipment communicates uh, uh, bi-directionally with the operant chamber and detects inputs, for example, uh, that it presses. It also produces outputs that result in stimuli events in the chamber, for example, uh, turn on lights, uh, tones, or the feeder. <clears throat> Most operant uh, labs run thanks to the uh, use of commercial equipment sold by a few companies. The equipment that now gets exported to number, uh, numerous countries has become a standard for good reasons. It is uh, reliable, it is durable, it is precise. Uh, for, uh, for example, the standard metal associates uh, equipment has a 10 millisecond uh, resolution. Uh, with the addition of metal notation, it is really easy to program. Now, there are, of course, several cons to the use of commercial equipment. The, probably the most evident is the high cost of the, uh, of the equipment. Uh, which is particularly an issue for uh, young researchers, for small universities, or universities in developing countries. Uh, it's also bulky, so it's difficult to, to export. Uh, outside of the U.S. it's becoming increasingly difficult to get and repair the equipment uh, when needed. It is difficult to alter the set, the set of the chamber, and it is too expensive to be used for classroom demonstration. Now, if we analyze the equipment that we use for operant research, uh, we'll realize quickly that it's relatively simple. In the most extreme cases, we need to record uh, responses that could occur up to 30 times per second. And that is the case of keypacks in pigeons in BRH schedules. We also require a system to deliver immediately consistent stimuli that, that serve as reinforcer. Uh, as reinforcers like uh, 45 milligram foot pellets or drops of water. And we also need to present visual and auditory signals that could be used as discriminative stimuli, among other functions. So given these characteristics, I thought that it would be easy to create my own equipment to conduct operant research in Mexico. Making my own equipment, I thought, could help me to conduct research immediately uh, instead of going through the hassle of uh, requesting the funds, waiting for the funds to arrive, buying the equipment, wait for the equipment. I have to say that I was wrong about this being easy or fast, but I was right about the rest. In this tutorial, I will describe how the equipment that I designed to conduct uh, open research works, how it evolved, and I will also describe a new system based on a, a new microcontroller board. Uh, and in combination with this board, a development that I think uh, might be useful uh, is programming guided by state charts that is an evolution of finite state machine diagrams. Once the state chart is filled with the information of the procedure, it can be transferred to the programming code by changing the values of variable, the variables and by activating lines of code. Uh, so, no knowledge of programming is required. Uh, so, therefore, with this uh, tutorial, I will also describe a systematic way of arranging a wide range of experimental procedures used in operant uh, research. 
Well, my first goal in this journey was to create uh, my own control equipment, and there were already a few notable examples. Uh, this is the amazing but now dated uh, Palia board that is shown in this picture. And I also found an interesting paper by Dr. Iverson, in which he used the parallel port of a computer to control a camera when a response was detected. I later used this idea uh, to create my own interface to control an operant condition in Chainburg, but this system is also dated now. Early during my attempts uh, to build my own equipment, I found a global community uh, of makers online that created these ingenious gadgets, wrote their, their programs, and they were willing to share this information with everyone. So this is what we know as an open source policy. So it was at this point that I, I knew that if, if I succeeded in, created my, in creating my own equipment, I could share the ideas with others. The project started uh, formally in 2013 with an international development grant. Uh, <clears throat> this is an early, not so great example of an opera condition chamber that we use for classroom demonstration. And my control equipment is based on the popular Arduino boards. Uh, on the screen is the most popular model, the Arduino Uno. This inexpensive and easy to find uh, board works as a miniature computer that executes one program at a time and reads the status of inputs and outputs. It has 14 uh, digital pins that can be used to detect whether a switch is on or off, or uh, can turn on devices, or can turn on or off devices. Uh, it has also six uh, analog pins that can be used as additional digital pins, or can read the range, uh, range of values. As a standalone interface, it has a one millisecond uh, resolution. Now, I will show you briefly how to use it. Uh, this is the Arduino board out of the box. For me, it helps to see that there are no tricks involved. Uh, this is how it works. Uh, the board uh, has a USB connector and pins labeled on the side, as you can see here. These wires that are known as jumper wires uh, can be connected uh, to the board or can be to, uh, connected together to make longer wires. A USB cable is required to connect the board uh, to a computer. And to work uh, with Arduino, the Arduino IDE software must be installed. Uh, so here I am installing the software downloaded from the website arduino.cc. The software is free to download and use. Uh, I'm going to accelerate the installation process. And I'm going to go to the end. When installation process uh, ends, uh, you will be able to see this screen. In this screen, a program can be written and then uploaded to the Arduino board. When it is uploaded, the program is executed repeatedly whenever the board is powered on via USB or with an additional, uh, an additional power supply. Okay, so I'm going to show you briefly how it works uh, for operant research. Uh, and let me start with inputs. Uh, responses can be detected using micro switches. This is a, a, a precision micro switch that is used in commercial equipment. It can be found easily in electronic stores online. And this is how the micro switch is connected. One wire is connected to a pin labeled gram and the other to a numbered pin, for example, pin number two uh, or eight. Uh, a switch simply connects the two wires together when it's pressed. Uh, in, the, in the switch, one wire goes to the common terminal and the other wires, a wire goes to the uh, normally open terminal. And this is all we need for an input device. 
Now let's go to the other side. Let me show you how to generate an output. Uh, an LED will serve as an example that can be used as a visual signal in a chamber. So an LED is the abbreviation of light emitting diode. It generates a light if an electric, electric current flows uh, through the terminals. And it uses a resistor, but these uh, LEDs can be bought with the resistor included, like this one I got here from AliExpress. Okay, one pin of the LED goes to a number pin. In this case, I'm going to use number two. And the other goes to ground. This LED has colored wires to simplify the connection. Now, this is the Arduino IDE window that I previously installed. And this is how it is programmed. First, we need to declare two variables that correspond to the number of pins in the board. The switch is number eight and the LED number two. Then we need to state that the LED in pin two is an output device and the lever in pin eight is an input device. Now in this section uh, labeled loop, we write the program that will be executed repeatedly. In this example, we state that if the lever changes from high to low, the LED will be activated. The LED remains, remains on for 1,000 milliseconds, that's a delay, and it is turned off afterwards. The program is uploaded to the board by clicking this arrow, and it's ready to go. So here is the Arduino board working with the example. Uh, I power it with the computer, and if I press the switch, the LED will turn on for one second, or 1,000 milliseconds. Very, very easy. These basic applications, just to show you the logic behind the equipment uh, that I designed. Initially, I planned to use the Arduino interface, as a, uh, the Arduino as an interface, a standalone interface, but memory limitations of the board made it impossible. So I solved uh, the problems uh, by using the Arduino as an interface working in combination with a computer. So the Arduino board generates outputs and reads the states of inputs and schedules of reinforcement are written and executed with Visual Basic running in a PC. And this was the setup for testing. An Arduino worked as a standalone board that generated simulated responses with a duration of starting at one millisecond and an inter-response time by RT of one millisecond. These simulated responses activated a solid state relay and were recorded with an Arduino connected to a PC running the experimental procedure in Visual Basic. Uh, then I changed the simulated response duration and IRT to determine the point in which all responses were recorded. I decided to produce the simulated responses with a second Arduino board because these boards are incredibly uh, precise. This is an oscilloscopic reading of the continuous signal produced by the Arduino board turning on and off an output of 4 milliseconds with a 4 millisecond interval. Each dotted rectangle in the grid that you can barely see is five volts high and two milliseconds wide. So the yellow line is the reading and it's, it's practically identical to the expected value. With these tests, we found that uh, with concurrent schedules, 100% of the simulated responses were recorded if a minimum duration of 12 milliseconds and 12 milliseconds IRT were produced. Visual Basic, however, limits the resolution of the system to 15 milliseconds. This is not that bad considering that uh, the old relay equipment uh, functioned in this way. Whenever a response was detected, a relay was activated for 15 to 30 milliseconds to produce a stable pulse, and that was the duration of the response. So it's actually similar to that. So these tests, uh, well, we also test the outputs that were produced after 21.3 milliseconds, but there are no comparison points with this result. 
So with these results, we prove that the Arduino Visual Basic interface reached the requirements of, the, uh, of most experiments, experiments and outcome research. And we published this paper in, in 2015, and it became the basis of what we did afterwards, like in this couple of papers. Now, I have to say that all the programs are open source and can be downloaded, downloaded free, uh, freely. Uh, all the links are included in the paper, and they can also be found in my website. Uh, one important consideration is that the performance can be affected by the load in the PC. So the computer running the, visual, uh, the Arduino Visual Basic interface cannot be used for other tasks while, while it's running uh, the schedules. There were, there were also some issues that complicated the, the construction at the time. One uh, was that uh, we needed to add uh, an integrated circuit to control uh, a system of relays uh, for the open condition chamber. We also uh, suggested another setup with solid state relays, but these are not easily found. So it was still complicated to build. Uh, my former grad students and I have simplified the construction over the years and have updated the programs to run in newer versions of Visual Basic. These updates that do not require an integrated circuit uh, will be included in a chapter that is still in progress. So if you are interested in these new versions, please let me know and I will send the new programs to you. Well, initially the interface was used with commercial chambers. I bought a couple of chambers from eBay. Uh, this one even came with free, but probably not so fresh pellets in the dispensary. This is an early example in the classroom in which the operant chamber looks not so bad at the distance, but it wasn't great up close. So fortunately, not long afterwards, I discovered 3D printing. 3D printing had, had, had been used before, and these are only two remarkable examples. A design program like, Fu like Fusion 360 can be used to create uh, models of the parts can be used to modify exist existing ones. Most parts used in operant conditioning chambers are composed of simple uh, geometric figures, so a basic tutorial on how to use Fusion 360 is generally enough to design all the parts of an operant conditioning chamber. Other parts like acrylic wool, uh, wools uh, can be cut from acrylic using a laser cutter. I don't have a laser cutter, so I just create the files and send them to, to a laser cutting service. With some parts, we just got lucky. Uh, the stainless steel straws became popular, and we started using eight by 215 uh, millimeters, millimeter straws for the chamber floor. And for the foot tray, we use a steel handle for sliding doors that I bought in a hardware store. This is a basic 3D printed operant chamber. This particular model was used in the classroom with a simplified version of the interface that was manually controlled. This equipment uh, even re uh, received some attention from the maker communi maker's community. Uh, this operant chamber appeared in 3dprint.com, which was nice, I think. And this is a more recent model with a feeder uh, dispenser and retractable levers. And we described the instructions uh, for building these 3D printed operant chambers in this paper. Following the open source philosophy, all designs, models created with 3D and 2D software can be freely downloaded. We created a GitHub space to share the files. This is a well known uh, repository for uh, makers. All the links are included in the paper, and all the files can be downloaded at once in a folder. In the folder, we included uh, 3D animations that show how the pieces are put together.
And we also included images of the components that we use so that they can be identified easily. Uh, we found that it's, it helps a lot if we have an image of the part that we need to buy to compare it with the image of online. We also replaced uh, some parts that were previously difficult to assembly, like the relay system. Uh, we found that these relay modules can replace the circuit that we described in the 2015 papers. These modules do not require assembly and can be connected to an Arduino board with a few jumper wires. In this picture, a water pump that we use to deliver water reinforcement is connected to a relay and controlled with an Arduino board. In the 2022 paper, we also included tests of this water pump. Now, the advantages of building open source open condition equipment are that it is expected to reduce costs of, condu uh, of conducting open demonstrations and research. It is useful for teaching labs and for researchers with limited access to funding. It does not require big spaces. It can be used in a small table. It is easy to build, even with limited knowledge of electronics, programming, and 3D printing, and it can be gradually modified to meet the standards and requirements of behavioral sciences. Now, my goal from the beginning was to create a system that is easy to build and easy to program. So following this goal, I designed a new system. I knew that I had to get rid of Visual Basic for several reasons. Probably the most important is to have a system that does not depend on a computer. If the program is run exclusively on the microcontroller board, the system would be faster and more stable. But this, of course, required a different board. And I got lucky again. This is the recently released Arduino Uno R4 Minima board. It has a similar design to the previous Arduino board, but it has some important advantages. It has 256 kilobytes of memory to write programs, and it has a faster processor. It doesn't look like much, but I will show you what you can do with this board. The electronic, I'm going to divide the electronics uh, control system in two parts, just for simplicity. This is the, the part of the control section. The Arduino R4 is connected to a small screen to keep track of experimental events is connected to an SD memory uh, board to store real-time data and to a real-time clock to maintain the date and the time even without being connected to a computer and just a button to start the session. This is the second part. This is the part that interfaces with the operand chamber. And here we have a 40-pin terminal uh, block connector that can be connected, in this case, to a relay uh, module. And uh, I have two micro switches. To work with uh, 3D printed chambers, um, I included also the, the 12 volt power supply, uh, voltage converter, an LED, and a stepper motor controller. If, uh, if this system is required to control uh, commercial chambers, the power supply can be replaced with a 24 or 28 uh, volt power supply. A 20 volt, 24 volt power supply can be also used to power the Arduino board. This is the list of the components of this new system. I bought everything from Amazon just to get from, us, from, from one place, and you can see how ridiculously inexpensive this is compared, of course, with uh, commercial equipment. There are two additional important components. This is a shield that goes on top of the Arduino with a 40-pin connector and a ribbon uh, flat uh, cable that is used to connect the two sections of the equipment. This is how it looks when it's assembled. The Arduino board is below the ribbon cable and the shield. All the components are soldered and the wires are connected with the screw terminals to improve reliability. This is the section on the other end of the ribbon wire that is going to be connected to the upper chamber. 
Now, of course, schedules of reinforcement can be written directly in the, in the simplified version of C++ that is used for Arduino. But it may take a lot of time to learn the programming language, especially for generating uh, experimental procedures. So I decided to, to create a modular program that users could modify not by writing code, but just by changing lines. This, however, can be done only if the schedules of reinforcement and the procedures containing the schedules are conceptualized with a common coherent structure. And there are important antecedents to this idea. In the late 1950s, uh, Magner described a notation system that provided a description of schedules of reinforcement based on symbolic diagrams and was useful to organize a wide range of procedures. In this example, response A produces a stimulus S. If a response occurs in the presence of a stimulus S, a reinforcement is delivered. This is, of course, the description of a chain schedule. According to Menger, by presenting a set of intricate interrelationships in a concise and schematic form, a diagrammatic or symbolic notation can often lay bare the essential structural, fe the structural features of these interrelations, thereby facilitating their analysis. He goes on saying, a good notation system could implement the discovery of formal parallels between behavioral procedures and generally suggest the schemes for their classification. Magnetic system was influential, influential, influential sorry, in subsequent important developments in the field. A few years later, Snapper and colleagues used finite state machine FSM diagrams to expand Magnetic notation and make it congruent with procedures involving sequential processes. In the now classic book, The Theory of Reinforcement Schedules, edited by Schoenfeld, Snapper, Knapp, and Kushner describe extensively the diagrams in the chapter titled Mathematical Descriptions of Schedules of Reinforcement. In FSM diagrams, the system can only be in one state at a time, those are the circles. Arrows show transitions. The label on each arrow shows the event that causes the transition. So in this example, we have the system starts in, in state one. If there is a response, there's a transition to state two, in which the reinforcer is delivered, and three seconds after that, uh, the system returns to state one. This is just the fixed ratio one schedule. Now, FSM diagrams uh, are precise, but can become complicated rapidly. This is a diagram of a concurrent VI-VI, with a three seconds change of delay. In this example, uh, the first two state sets, one, two, must read the state of state set three. So here we start to see important issues. If a condition additional to the schedule is required, it is generally added in a new state set. Because each state set requires different sets and transitions, it becomes complicated to follow the interaction between the state sets FSM notation is useful for schedules of reinforcement that, that follow a sequential order, but suffers when the schedule is embedded in a complex procedure that could include concurrent or sequential conditions with multiple stimuli per state. Nevertheless, in the mid-1970s, uh, the state notation evolved into, into state programming in the system that is known as a SCED, that in turn evolved into the modern mid-state notation that became the cornerstone, the cornerstone for the success of many associates. In the late 1980s, David Harrell, a mathematician from the Weizmann Institute of Science, described a new approach to FSM diagrams. Harrell noted that a complex system cannot be beneficially described uh, with FSM diagrams because there's an unmanageable, exponentially growing multitude of states. Kano proposed that state charts uh, could be used to diagram procedures that require uh, concurrent and hierarchical states. The state charts have, uh, have become increasingly popular because of their application in programming artificial intelligence and video games. 
this state chart is used to describe how character involved, uh, can be involved in two activities, survive or fight in a video game, and each of these activities has sub-states. In this second example, what is known as a unified modeling language, UML, is used in this state chart to describe the functioning of a model. In this diagram, there are certain important conventions. States are denoted with round corner uh, rectangles. The film bar, a black circle on top signals the beginning. And arrows within the states show transitions, and the circle with a black dot denotes the final state. Actions executed in each substate are indicated within the corresponding state. So now let's apply this logic to our procedures. Our procedures can be decomposed in states. First, our session uh, includes an initial or preset state in which the session is loaded. In this state, we have to define the conditions that will terminate the session. Also, we need a final state in which the session ends and data are stored. Now, the most basic procedures uh, require two additional states. A set of state in which antecedent conditions are executed, for example, turning on the house light, and the main state in which the schedule of reinforcement is executed. If more complex uh, uh, procedures are required, we can use two main states concurrently or two sets of states sequentially. Now, let me show you a working example. This is an FR schedule. We have uh, one initial state that moves to the preset, and I included spaces to be filled by the user in order to use the diagram later as an aid to create experimental procedure in Arduino code. So let's say the session will stop up the, after 1800 seconds or after 50 reinforcers. We won't be using the section of number of cycles with this schedule. Now, the arrow takes us to the state A setup in which the stimuli required are turned on. Uh, let's write house light and extend the lever because I have a retractable lever. And now the arrow takes us to a state A schedule. Here we have a subset A1 in which the user writes the schedule and the values required. For example, fixed ratio, 10. And we indicate that we only need one response by crossing out response two. The consequence for fulfilling the criteria is full reinforcement. And this schedule uh, does not terminate by time. That is useful only for multiple and big schedules. So I'm just going to cross this out. I create a loop that in this case will never uh, produce a transition. So it will run forever if I don't do anything about it. But I, I will leave it like this for now. I will add a small mark to signal that this is the first uh, state that is activated when the state A schedule is reached. Now let's finish this by adding an arrow that will terminate the session if the preset uh, settings are met. Now, if you're wondering why do we need this uh, this is the Arduino IDE, and I open uh, the Arduino program that I created, that is called Arduino Open Lab. I will make this program available, of course, for free in my GitHub space. This code is organized in tabs. The user selects the tab session values and writes the values entered in the preset, then selects the experimental procedure tab and searches for the section state A setup activate the house light, leave extend left activated, and go to section state A schedule, and select the schedule FR for A1. The values of the FR uh, can be modified in this tab. Go back, select full reinforcement, and we're done. Verify the code, upload it to the board, and we're ready to go. Now, pressing the button on the board starts the session. So here, uh, the session begins with the introduction of the retractable lever, 
and I'm picking up some. So all the following examples start uh, in the same way. So the EFR that, uh, that we programmed is now running here. So that, that was the FR10 that we programmed. Now this is another example, the concurrent schedule. So this is the previous diagram. So I will add another substate, A2. These two schedule actually alternate really fast. We clear the values for the FR and add the variable interval schedule, 20 seconds. Uh, response one, reinforcer, uh, no time termination. On the other side, the same thing, but I select a different response, response two, uh, for reinforcement, and now I have the option for a change order delay of three seconds. And this interaction with A1, I will just write or. This is important to differentiate the schedule from other schedules in which the, the two are running simultaneously. So now let's go to the code. Uh, the house light is already selected. Let's activate the VI in A1 and the VI in A2. The values are changed in the schedule values tab. We select, we select reinforcer two for schedule two. And we also need to specify response one for schedule A1 and response two for schedule A2. Change over uh, is set to true, so we're ready to go. So this is the concurrent BI20, BI20. So this is my final example, a change schedule. Uh, this is the first uh, diagram with the fixed ratio 10. I'm going to write the number of cycles in this case because I have a pair of schedules in sequence. I will move this up. And this is important, the consequence in schedule A1 now is going to state B. And I add state B. I don't need to terminate anything in the state A for now. I will add a light in state B. I will go to state B schedule. Now I have a sequential uh, state that is similar to the previous one. And I fill the blanks with fixed interval 10 seconds, one response, the same response as the previous uh, A1, foot reinforcement. And just for simplicity, I'm not going to add the part of the termination of the session, but that goes below that part. Move this out of the way. Now let's change the, the number of cycles. House late extend lift are on. We replace the VI schedules with the FR for A1 with a value of 10. We go back. In this case, uh, response two is now false. We don't need it. Change over delay false. We don't need that. And this is important. Uh, do not reinforce. Go to the next state. So I need to remove the reinforcers for this uh, link. Now we go to state uh, B setup. 
I'm going to turn on the light to make it a chain scheduling and go to a state B scheduling. Now uh, I have to activate the schedule for B1, the sequential one, the fixed interval, 10 seconds. Go back, uh, response B1 true. Deliver reinforcement in this case. And at the end of state B, turn off stimulus. Upload the code, and there we go. This is the first on signal link. Okay, so I recorded and showed you the videos just, just to show you that I'm not trying to fool and Elizabeth Holmes and you. This actually works. I'm sorry, that's a tech joke. Uh, data are stored in uh, the micro SD memory. It, st it stores the data in real time and prints a summary of the number of responses and reinforces at the end. The file name is changed in every session to avoid overwriting. If a computer is connected to the interface, then uh, the real-time data, data can be shown in the serial monitor, but it does not interfere with the function of the interface. So I created a, a full map of schedules that I hope can be useful for open laboratories it is read from top to bottom. Uh, this map includes two substates uh, with schedules running simultaneously and two high-level states in sequence. If more states are needed, they can be added following the same logic. Uh, I'm going to get closer. The diamonds represent a choice that is useful in concurrent chains procedure. If A1 was completed, B1 is executed, for example. And this part is from sequential schedules. So this is how we use the system. Uh, fill in the blanks, modify the code, upload to the, to the board, and enjoy your data. So now we have a disclaimer. There are many different ways uh, to arrange uh, schedules in state charts, and probably you can think of better ways to do this. Uh, this organization, organization was the best way that I found to couple the state charts with the argument of gold, uh, at least so far. Also, there are a lot of redundancies in the code, and in programming terms, this is not the simplest nor the most elegant way to program. However, I wanted to create functions that resemble modules such that it is easy to add new states, each with an independent function containing a schedule. So there are a lot of similar functions. The included features so far are basic schedules, uh, FR, both the ones that I have on the screen. Uh, the modular programming allows for uh, tandem chain multiple and all these sort of schedules. There is a change over delay and the concurrent change procedures. Uh, I conducted uh, the same tests with this uh, interface. It has a one millisecond resolution, thanks to the Arduino board, uh, responses of 12 milliseconds uh, and four millisecond IRTR perfectly recorded. So this is better than the Arduino Visual Basic. I hope to publish this in the instructions to build this soon and to upload the files to a GitHub repository. So I hope that this new system that I tried to make up as versatile and easy to use as possible could help instructors to set up new lab laboratories and aid researchers to study behavior under different schedules of reinforcement. The state charts could help to describe, organize, and simplify uh, the description of our procedures, not only in basic, but also in applied research. Uh, so here's my email in case you want to contact me with questions about the equipment. I'm always happy to share my experiences, designs, and code with you. Thank you.